And this week from Fantasyland presenting a tribute to Joel Chandler Harris. Now, here is your host, Walt Disney. For four generations, these magical tales of Br'er Rabbit and his talking animal friends have delighted the hearts of children of all ages and in all parts of the world and gave the people outside the South their first knowledge of these beloved animal legends told on the plantations by the old Negro storytellers who had been handing them down from generation to generation. Later in the program, we're going to visit Uncle Remus and listen to one of his stories. But first, let's make ourselves acquainted with the truly gentle and modest man who gave us the beloved Uncle Remus story, Joel Chandler Harris. So the story goes in the Okefenokee, as everybody knows in the Okefenokee, when Mr. Fat Rabbit plays his little joke, he will fool Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear. Joel Chandler Harris was born in Edenton, Georgia in 1848. His parents were never married, and his father abandoned him shortly after his birth. He was raised by his mother, Mary Ann Harris, in a small cottage owned by the wealthy and generous Dr. Andrew Reed. Mary Ann would work multiple jobs while raising Harris. She would often read him stories of Southern folk heroes, inspiring an interest in literature at a young age. Dr. Reed offered to pay for the young man's tuition, and he sent Harris to the local academy. On top of his illegitimacy, Harris had red hair and a stutter, which would have made him a target of harassment among his classmates. Luckily, Harris established himself as the class clown, earning the respect of the other boys. He was highly skilled at reading and writing, but he wasn't a great student, leading him to drop out of school in order to find work. In 1861, when Harris was 13 years old, the Civil War broke out. A year later, he was hired by a man named Joseph Addison Turner, the owner of a massive plantation near Edenton. Turner requested that Harris help him print the country's only plantation-centric newspaper, The Countryman. Turner became a father figure for the 14-year-old, further educating him on classic literature and helping him evade the draft. He would also allow Harris to publish some of his writings in the paper. During his time at Turner's plantation, Harris would often visit the slaves' quarters. Here, Uncle George Terrell, Old Herbert, and Aunt Chrissy, all African people enslaved by Turner, would tell Harris some of their folk tales. Most of these stories had originated many years earlier in Africa, but had since been passed down and modified. These were often told at night as a means of entertainment and escapism, but more importantly, it was a way to preserve the unique culture and teachings that slaveholders were trying their best to erase. These stories would sometimes teach a lesson or provide an explanation for a natural phenomenon, and they would often employ the use of animals for the roles of the characters. Harris latched onto these stories, and even more so, the storytellers. He felt that he had a connection with the enslaved people because of the hardship he had endured for the way he looked and sounded despite, in reality, their plights being incomparable in every sense of the word. After the war, Harris would go on to write for several publications. Most notably, in 1876, Harris was hired to write for the Atlanta Constitution. He wrote as an advocate for racial reconciliation and was considered a progressive writer for his region. More notably, Harris began writing a series of short stories for the paper, referred to as the Uncle Remus Tales. Harris recounted the stories told to him by the storytellers that he met on Turner's plantation, combining them into the character Uncle Remus, a kind-hearted, exuberant storyteller that told the tales of a trickster rabbit named Br'er Rabbit. The African hare was often used as a character in the folklore of the western and southern regions of the continent, and Harris heard versions of many of these tales. He would publish a few of them in books of his own, compiling them into Uncle Remus, His Songs and His Sayings in 1880, and Nights with Uncle Remus in 1883. These would receive national attention, spreading throughout the country and giving Harris notoriety in the late 19th century. Harris would pass away in 1908 at the age of 59. His work would be influential among other writers at the time, but his legacy would be controversial. He was accused of appropriating African culture, and his role in preserving the folklore is contentious even today. Perhaps most controversial is the dialect he implemented into his stories, which today reads as stereotypical, offensive, and outdated although some historians believe that it could have been historically accurate based off of documents and accounts from the time. However, the controversial nature of his works would not stop a growing California film production company from adapting a few of the Uncle Remus stories into a feature film. Out of the singing heart of the Old South come the timeless tales of Uncle Remus, forever fresh and new, sparkling with enchanting fantasy. This is motion picture storytelling at its best. Here is entertainment, so refreshing, so heartlifting, so satisfactual, you'll want to see it again and again. And there is Walt Disney's cartoon fun to give you that zippity doo dah feeling. Walt Disney's Song of the South premiered in Atlanta, Georgia on November 12, 1946. 
The film was a passion project of Disney, who enjoyed the Uncle Remus stories as told by Harris. He had been asking the Harris estate for the film rights since 1939. The film starred Bobby Driscoll as Johnny, a young boy who moves to his grandmother's plantation. His troubles, ranging from his father's absence to local bullies, catch the attention of Uncle Remus, played by James Baskett. It is important to note that in both Harris's tales and Song of the South, Uncle Remus is not a slave, despite his character being based off of the enslaved people Harris met on the Turnwald Plantation. Song of the South does little to clarify this, and it is essentially left up to the audience to interpret whether or not Uncle Remus is a sharecropper. The wise storyteller helps the young boy with his problems by recounting the stories of the Briar Patch, with Br'er Rabbit evading the clutches of Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear. These segments were told through hand-drawn animation, sometimes interacting with the live-action footage. The second hybrid animation in a feature film after 1944's The Three Caballeros. The film is most remembered for these colorful animated sequences and for its signature song, Zippity Doo Dah. The film's premiere in Atlanta, Georgia was the event of the year, with festivities welcoming Disney and the film's main cast. Due to racial segregation in Georgia, James Baskett was not allowed to attend Song of the South's premiere, a horrible situation that made national news. On top of this, the film was chastised by progressives and critics alike, with many African-American activists pointing out the film's offensive dialect and the glorification of the South and the master-slave relationship. While critics deemed the film boring, they claimed that the live-action segments were too long and the only moments of true Disney entertainment were during the animated sequences. However, the film was met with glowing reviews in Atlanta, and it proved to be a crowd-pleaser, especially among families. The issues and protests on the film's content would only worsen as the film premiered in the rest of the country, especially in New York and Los Angeles. Walt Disney seemed to anticipate the backlash. At the reception after the film's premiere, Disney reportedly joked that he had to tone down Uncle Remus's dialect despite his claims of historical accuracy. The criticism of the dialect mirrors that of Harris's work, so if nothing else, Disney's adaptation was true to its source material. James Baskett would win an honorary Academy Award for his performance in Song of the South in 1948. Supposedly, Disney urged the Academy's president to consider Baskett for a special award, since Baskett's acting performance was praised by both audiences and critics. At the time, the film did not have a lasting impact on the Walt Disney brand, positive or negative. Ten years later in 1956, a year after the opening of Disneyland, the film would be re-released in theaters for its 10th anniversary. This brought a large marketing campaign for the film. Even 10 years later, the film played well to audiences, and little to no controversy came with its re-release. Despite an entire episode of the Disneyland TV show dedicated to Joel Chandler Harris airing in 1956, the characters from Song of the South were not represented in the parks. Oddly enough, the first time Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Bear would appear in a theme park wouldn't be in Anaheim. It would be right where Harris grew up, and where he first published the Uncle Remus stories. Mr. Fox and Bear are coming down the road. So we went in the old plantation cave. You see, everybody is chasing everybody, and anybody's chasing anybody, because the rabbits are running away, and they're running away from the fox, and the fox is running away from the bear. Six Flags Over Georgia opened on June 16, 1967. The second Six Flags Park after Six Flags Over Texas, Six Flags Over Georgia was located just west of Atlanta in Austell, Georgia. Similar to its predecessor, the park was themed after the six nations that had ruled over Georgia, Spain, France, the United Kingdom, the United States, the state of Georgia, and the Confederate States of America. Each of these had a dedicated land. In the Confederate section, a dark ride named Tales of the Okefenokee, the Old Plantation Legends, took guests on a slow boat ride through colorful scenes with familiar characters. The ride was named after the Okefenokee Swamp located in southern Georgia. While the ride did feature a rabbit, fox, and a bear, Uncle Remus was not present. It is speculated that Six Flags did not have permission to use the characters from Harris's stories, but decided to get as close as they could. The attraction was originally supposed to be housed inside of a recreation of a southern plantation mansion, and guests would board the ride outside of the house through Uncle Remus's cabin. This never came to fruition, and the ride was instead housed inside of a plain-looking building. The 1967 version of Tales of the Okefenokee featured small animated figures with simple movement loops. Guests would board their boats and go on a tour of the swamp, seeing scenes of Br'er Rabbit attempting to hit Br'er Bear with a bat, a group of rabbits following Br'er Bear and Br'er Fox, and Br'er Rabbit with his tar baby. The tar baby, which years later would become a derogatory racial slur, was a small doll made out of tar in one of the stories told by Harris. This story would also make its way into one of the animated segments of Song of the South. Little is known about this version of Tales of the Okefenokee, and it would be completely redesigned for the 1968 season. 
Six Flags commissioned puppeteers and television stars Sid and Marty Croft to redesign the ride. The new ride featured figures that were much larger than the original version, with more colorful critters similar to the Disney version of the Uncle Remus tales. The ride also had a much clearer storyline. After guests boarded the ride, they would float down the river into a swamp filled with greenery. They would quickly come upon owls sitting in trees and crows singing a short song. Welcome neighbor, welcome to the Oki This song had a similar theme to How Do You Do from Song of the South, although this could be a coincidence. After the crow's song, the boat came up on Mr. Fox, Mr. Bear, and Mr. Rabbit fishing off of a worn down plantation. Also in this scene was a bullfrog tanning, a raccoon holding a picnic basket, and a turtle sleeping on his back. After this, the boat entered a cave, revealing the animals having formed a band with various objects. There is also an appearance of a Mrs. Rabbit. A group of carrots sing a song of warning. Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear are seen holding a sack with Mr. Rabbit inside. However, in the next scene, the Parliament of Owls can be seen circling above Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear, holding a bedsheet to make it appear as a ghost. Mr. Rabbit escapes as Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear are distracted by the terrifying spirit. Mr. Rabbit's escape is confirmed by a scene of the Happy Rabbit family. Mr. Rabbit is milking a cow, while few of the younger rabbits have made small, ugly puppets of Mr. Bear and Mr. Fox. The crows return to sing another song of warning. The boat then enters a windy cave, and a blacklit scene of Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear stashing explosive and weapons reveals their next plan, to murder everyone. The two fire rifles at the boat as it passes. As the ride vehicle exits the cave, it floats under a fallen tree, with Mr. Bear and Mr. Fox at the top holding red lanterns and yelling, Beware! Beware! Go back! The boat then follows a sharp decline, causing a splash. The next scene is even more horrific. A thunderstorm looms above guests as lightning strikes and wind howls. A tree with an evil face falls toward the boat. Owls, less friendly than before, eye the boat from the trees as rattlesnakes swing at the passengers. Closer to the boat, alligators chomp at guests. The boat heads into what looks like brush, but it is quickly revealed to be the briar patch, alleviating the tension as guests pass by a scene of the rabbit family at Christmas, slicing into a large roasted carrot. The children are singing a unique carol. The boat exits the briar patch to clear skies and Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear in the swamp, covered in frogs. The final scene shows Mr. Rabbit hanging a hornet's nest on a pole over Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear, who are running from the swarm. The rest of the family and the other animals are having a carnival, and everyone sings the Okefenokee's national anthem. The final character is Mrs. Rabbit, who exclaims, Bye now, y'all hurry back here. The boat enters a diamond mine and exits the ride. The updated version of the ride was impressive and elaborate, the settings were dense, and the storytelling techniques implemented in the ride rivaled those found at Disneyland. The attraction became a favorite among guests at the park, especially among those that preferred tamer rides. The ride was also a favorite among teenagers looking for a dark, secluded place to revisit the classic tales of Joel Chandler Harris. Tales of the Okefenokee also brought Sid and Marty Croft into the world of theme parks, and the two would open their own indoor amusement park, the world of Sid and Marty Croft, in Atlanta, Georgia, less than a decade after working on Tales of the Okefenokee. Unfortunately, the second version of Tales of the Okefenokee would only last 13 seasons in Six Flags Over Georgia, closing at the end of the 1980 season. The crude animated figures had a short lifespan, and the ride quickly deteriorated, with fewer and fewer effects operating. Some of the figures, such as a few of the singing carrots, were removed completely. The humidity that accumulated in the show building was taking a toll on the ride's murals and the fur of the figures, and guests jumping off of the slow-moving boats would often steal things such as the clothes of the characters and in one instance, the rabbit's marionette of Br'er Bear. The audio department for the entire park was located right behind the walls of the Christmas scene, which had a very short audio loop on the rabbit family's Christmas song. Supposedly, this drove the audio technicians crazy, and they eventually just turned off the song, leaving that section of the ride silent. Perhaps the biggest reason for the attraction's downfall was a fire in its last season of operation. One of the singing carrots went up in flames due to an interior coil rapidly heating after the data machinery inside got stuck. 
This destroyed the entirety of the singing carrot scene, and the flames encroached on the surrounding scenes as well before it could be put out by park employees. In order to fill the space left by the fire, singing watermelons from the end of the ride were moved to the beginning, but this was merely a quick fix. The fire was the final nail in the coffin for the ride, and Six Flags made plans to replace it in the off-season in late 1980 and early 1981. In order to do this, they commissioned the Lark Amusement Ride Design Company and former Imagineers Gary Goddard and Albertino to completely redesign the ride. The only thing that would remain was the track and water systems. The rest would be completely destroyed. The figures were ripped from their place, mangled, and placed in the garbage. A few of the murals were given to a local theater company, and the neon lighting effect from the storm scene was planned to be reused in the new ride, but construction crews accidentally broke it during the conversion. The ride building was bulldozed, and Tales of the Okefenokee was completely leveled, with only a few elements of the track layout and ground floor remaining. The construction crew worked throughout the off-season to create the ride's replacement, to be named the Monster Plantation. Incredibly, they were able to complete the ride before Six Flags Over Georgia's 1981 operating season. The new ride took guests on a boat ride through a southern plantation house filled with animatronics of monsters, some friendly and some scary. The ride would last until the end of the 2008 operating season, ending its 28-year run at the park. Goddard would be brought back to revamp the ride, which would remain similar to the Monster Plantation, but with almost every element modernized. The new version of the ride opened in May of 2009, renamed the Monster House. While Tales of the Okefenokee no longer entertains guests today, a ride with a very similar concept does, one that a majority of Americans are familiar with. On October 1st, 1971, the Magic Kingdom and the Walt Disney World Resort opened its gates to guests. An original attraction in the new park was the Mickey Mouse Review, an animatronic show featuring numerous animatronic characters from popular Disney animation singing classic songs from their films. Included was a rendition of Zippity Doodah sung by Br'er Fox, Br'er Bear, and Br'er Rabbit. This would be the first prominent appearance of the characters in the parks. The very next year, Song of the South was re-released in theaters. This theatrical campaign shifted the focus of the film from the live-action storyline to the cartoon characters, prominently featuring Br'er Fox, Br'er Bear, and Br'er Rabbit in marketing material. The film would be re-released again in 1973 as part of the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney Animation. The film would receive another re-release in 1980, this time to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Joel Chandler Harris's publishing of the Uncle Remus stories. In 1986, Song of the South would be re-released once again for its 40th anniversary. This theatrical run was surprisingly successful for box office revenue, but the film was not aging well at all. More critics than ever were pointing to the film's problematic elements, and the dialect used by Uncle Remus no longer sparked debate of historical accuracy. Instead, it was simply deemed one of the many racist elements of what was quickly becoming Disney's most controversial film. However, even the toughest critic at the time couldn't help but praise the film's animated sequences which were just as fun and bright as when they were released 40 years prior. Despite the film as a whole being shrouded in controversy, the critters of the Briar Patch were as popular as ever, and the film's award-winning song, Zippity Doodah, was considered the Walt Disney Company's national anthem. This was all great news for Walt Disney Imagineering, as they had been developing an attraction for Disneyland based off of the film's cartoon segments throughout the mid-80s. The attraction, to be named Zippity River Run, was to open in 1989, Disney's CEO at the time, a man named Michael Eisner, suggested slash demanded that the Imagineers change the name from Zippity River Run to Splash Mountain in order to promote the company's 1984 surprise hit Splash starring Tom Hanks. He reportedly also suggested they add a character from the film into the ride, which the Imagineers luckily pushed back against, but the name change remained. Splash Mountain opened on July 17, 1989 in Disneyland Park in Anaheim, California. The ride contained no reference of the live-action portions of the film. A few notable differences between the film and the ride are Br'er Frog taking the place of Uncle Remus as the narrator, and the replacement of the Tar Baby scene with a scene of Br'er Fox trapping Br'er Rabbit in a beehive. The ride was not marketed as a nostalgic trip through Disney's once classic and now infamous film, Song of the South. It was instead marketed as a high-octane, intense thrill ride. Interestingly, this was not an attempt to distance the ride from the controversial film. It was instead due to Eisner's desperate attempts to attract a young adult crowd to the parks, mostly his son Breck who he used to measure how tubular any given ride was. This resulted in a very bizarre marketing campaign for Splash Mountain, especially in retrospect. Ooh, no, uh, wait, wait, I was told that we could be the first to ride Splash Mountain and we're ready to go. Well, well, it's not open yet. Splash Mountain. 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 Splash
Two more Splash Mountains would open in the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World and in Tokyo Disneyland in 1992. This would be the last significant Song of the South related work to be released by Disney. The characters still appear in the parks and will make an occasional cameo with other classic Disney characters. And Disney will never turn down a reason to play Zippity Doodah. But other than that, Song of the South has been purposefully underutilized by the company. The film has not been released in the United States since its 1986 theatrical re-release. The only home video the film has seen have been from a few international distributors. The most recent statement from Disney has been from CEO Bob Iger himself, who stated that the film is quote, antiquated and fairly offensive, indicating that a home video release would not come anytime soon. Many critics and public figures have taken sides on the issue of whether Disney should release Song of the South. Some believe that Disney should release the film as an educational tool, providing supplementary materials explaining the shortcomings and problematic parts of the film. Some claim that it is best to forget the film entirely. Others claim that the actual film is not nearly as bad as some believe and Disney's refusal to release it only worsens the public's perception of it. Despite the lack of home video releases, a few copies of the film have found their way to the internet and are sometimes available for viewing. A conclusion as to just how offensive, racist, or problematic the film or Harris's work might be will certainly never be reached, and Disney may never release the film in any way. But with the available copies and plethora of literature on both sides of the argument, educating oneself is not difficult and should be encouraged, especially for those that are fans of Splash Mountain. The ride is now one of the most recognizable theme park rides of all time, with all three versions continuing to entertain adults and children alike. But those that visited Six Flags Over Georgia in its first decade of operation might notice something a bit too familiar in the Disney log flume. Tales of the Okefenokee might not have had a 50-foot drop, advanced audio animatronics, or the elaborate sculpting work that Splash Mountain did, but the similarities between the two attractions are almost too many to count. Some of Splash Mountain's elements are so similar to those of Tales of the Okefenokee that one might even think that the Disney attraction took inspiration from the Six Flags ride. Splash Mountain was the brainchild of Imagineer and Disney legend Tony Baxter. Baxter came up with the idea for the ride in 1983 while stuck in traffic. He was attempting to solve three issues at once. The lack of attractions in Disneyland's Bear Country, Disneyland President Dick Nunes' wish to have a log flume in the park, and the need for a new home for the America Sings animatronics after the attraction's inevitable closure. The solution to all three of these problems was Splash Mountain. One might wonder whether Baxter had ever made a trip to Six Flags Over Georgia and ridden Tales of the Okefenokee. One fan in particular actually had the opportunity to ask Baxter if he had ever ridden the Six Flags ride. Reportedly, Baxter lit up at the mention of the little-known ride and confirmed that he had in fact been on Tales of the Okefenokee. It is pretty remarkable that a forgotten ride at the small Six Flags Over Georgia could have influenced one of the best theme park rides of all time. And so our villain's little plot was spoiled on the spot. And Mr. Fox and Bear were captured in the end. And so we'll leave them to their fate, cause time is getting late. And we go floating gently round the bend. So the story goes in the Okefenokee. As everybody knows in the Okefenokee, when Mr. Fat Rabbit Plays his little jokey, we'll fool Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear.